Hello Cave Dwellers, before we start today's episode, the RMC 2022 charity calendar is now available. 100% of profits from this go to the charity All Sorts, a local charity to the cave who help families who have children with additional needs. And um, the theme for this year's calendar is computers and consoles behaving badly. They're all crashing, they're in various states of disrepair, and I think it's a wonderful calendar to hang on your wall. 100% of profits go to charity, and that is all of the sale thanks to the wonderful people at One Click Print who are footing the bill, taking the cost for producing this this year. So thank you so much, oneclickprint.com. Let's sell as many of these as possible and see if we can beat yet last year's amount. We raised £4,000 for charity last year. Let's see if we can smash that. Head over to rmcretro.store now to get yourself a copy. And now on with the video. Hello, cave dwellers. Welcome to the cave. No, it's not too early to have my Christmas jumper on. Way back in 2020, we asked the question, what were the very first video games released on CD? It was a really interesting episode. I'm not gonna spoil it for you. There's links down below if you want to go and watch that video now. And in our research for that episode, we came across another CD games pack, or at least a brief mention of it for the Commodore 64. But no matter where I looked, I just couldn't find this thing until today. Because right here, I have a copy of the elusive Rainbow Arts first CD edition. I first read about this in a copy of Zap Magazine from February 1990, in which the Codemasters CD was covered. That was released at £19.99 for the 30 games. And this, the Rainbow Arts First CD Edition, priced at £29.99, got a mention. And in that article, it states, a German edition has been on sale on the continent for some time. That led us deeper down the rabbit hole where we found that in Commodore User Magazine, this was reviewed in October of 1989, meaning the reviewers got it around about September, if not earlier, compared to the Codemaster CD, which was in December. So that means this was definitely released earlier based on the evidence that we have. Now, I've looked and looked for this for years. I had an alert set on eBay and finally last week it came up, it pinged up on my email and I immediately bought it. So today we're gonna have a look at this, the Rainbow Arts first edition CD for the Commodore 64. C64 games on CD. This is the future. Now, I couldn't not capture the unwrapping of this box. It's a 32-year-old video game without the seal broken, so I got the camera on for that just for you. Now, my first impression of this for something that would have been quite exciting at the time, games on a shiny CD, well, it's a pretty uninspired box, I think. If we look at the back, that's a little better. We've got screenshots of the 10 included games, which we'll hopefully get to play later but they're all worthy of being on this compilation and you get five bonus pieces of music from legendary composer Chris Hulsbeck. This being a Rainbow Arts compilation, the first game that I normally think of with Rainbow Arts is Turrican, but sadly that's nowhere to be seen on this. So I suppose we should probably break this thing open. You know, as a kid, the thought of carefully opening a video game with a scalpel would have been absolutely absurd. The wrapper would have been ripped off and on the floor within seconds. I think younger Neil would have been slightly appalled by this. That actually looks a lot better. I know people revel in the thought of owning brand new sealed games, but this looks so much smarter with the wrapping off. Almost like it had a poorly fitting suit on. Inside the box, we have the adapter, as was promised. It doesn't look that complex. And the way you use this is that it goes on the same port that you'd plug your data set on the C64. And it looks like you plug your audio cable into one side and it passes through a chip in the middle there. That's a hex inverter. The reason this is here is because the C64 is a little bit different to other micros of the era in that the data which is stored as audio on a cassette tape is converted from an analog audio wave into digital data within the data set itself. In other micros you would use a regular cassette deck to play audio into the computer and the chip to perform the conversion would be inside the computer. So the chip on the adapter here will be converting that audio's peaks and troughs into the ones and zeros before they hit the C64. And I think that's ripe for a 3D printed case in the modern day, just to protect it. The included guide comes with some handy information, such as, some very exotic CD players swap phases of the audio signals. 
You can help yourself by changing the connections within the chinch cable. I think that's a typo for cinch cable. If you're a handyman, just do it yourself. If not, don't worry, just visit an expert. The solution to all of life's problems, surely. A media that in itself is retro, but there's something about that shiny round disc that will always feel like the future to me. Ever since I saw a presenter spreading his breakfast on a CD to demonstrate its durability, I knew these would be for me. Let's give it the breakfast time test. Some honey, a bit of coffee. Should see it through. We can see that the CD was pressed by Sonopress, which I think is a German CD pressing plant, and that would align with Rainbow Arts being a German games publisher, and it's also reflected in the manual, which is German first and English second, and supports the magazine's claim earlier that this was released first in Germany. That would all make total sense. So to see how this works, to see if it's anything like that Codemasters CD, and just to see if the games are any good, we're gonna need a C64, we're gonna need a CD player, we're gonna need an audio cable, Let's get that all set up and try out the Rainbow Arts first CD edition. I've waited so long to try this. RMC is sponsored by MonsterJoysticks.com, quality joysticks and adapters to enjoy your favorite systems with, featuring genuine Sanware arcade parts. As the Commodore user article says, £29.99 for 10 games is okay value until you factor in that £150 had to be spent on a CD player. These would have to be damn good games to warrant that spend, and as many of you will have spotted, they're good games but they're not new releases for 1989. So I've popped a CD player underneath my monitor. You could of course use a portable CD player if you had one. And then we have to install the adapter into the cassette port, which just slots in like so. Then we need an audio cable, just the one cable needed. There's no need for stereo sound here. And the other end of my excessively long cable, I'm plugging into the headphone socket on the CD player. So hopefully that will work and I won't also need a separate amp in order to get this going. Let's just tidy up those cables up a little bit more. And it almost looks like a desktop PC. Kind of makes me want to get the CD TV out again to play with. Now the moment of truth, let's put the CD in. And that CD tray is moving at a pretty leisurely pace. I suspect it's seen better, more agile days in the past. Gobble that up, Mr. CD player. Nom, 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 nom. The CD player is picking up 33 tracks and over 52 minutes of audio. 33 tracks for 10 games and five music tracks included. How does that work then? Well, the manual says it has every track repeated on the CD so that if a track gets scratched, you might still be able to use it by using the second version of it later on the CD. To use the CD, we just type load and press enter, and then we press play on the CD player. And wait for it. Wait for it. Is anything happening? Okay, it's found something. And 45 seconds later, a rather snazzy little animation appears that takes us into the menu screen. In comparison, the Codemasters CD on the Spectrum had a loader like this, but that loaded from cassette tape and then you used the CD for the games. And that loader took 35 seconds, so it actually had the edge on this pack. Next, we pick the game we want to play, so I went with the classic Drop Zone, and then it tells you which track you need to play on the CD, and I'll do that now. And then we wait for the game to load. And what does that sound like? Prepare your ears. Turn this down maybe if you've got pets. This is Drop Zone loading from CD. Ouch. Games take between 30 and 50 seconds to load, and there are some multi-loaders in there. I think it was the game Jinx 
where it showed me a title screen and then it asked me to skip to the next CD track to continue loading. So we are loading data from CD once in game in that example, and it's not just loading it all into memory once and then you're playing. Why am I telling you that? Well, there were comments on the Codemasters CD video suggesting that it's not really a CD-ROM if it doesn't load from CD once the program is running. So it kind of addresses that argument. Now, don't get me wrong, I did have a lot of fun with the games on here, but going back to that Commodore user article, as it says, the games almost feel like an aside to the bizarre project itself of putting 8-bit games on CD. And I think with just 10 games on the CD, that novelty would have worn off quite quickly. Let's look at the ripped audio from the CD. This is drop zone from the CD. We can see there's a gap to allow the time for you to hit the space bar after you've pressed play, and then the data is about 30 seconds long, so the game is condensed down to 30 seconds. And this is possible because of the digital nature of the recording on the CD. Unlike a tape, we know it's not going to get stretched. We know that data won't get changed, so we can depend on it to load every single time nice and quickly. In comparison, this is the cassette tape version of the same game, which is nearly three and a half minutes long. And that seems like a really impressive time saving until we need to add the time for the menu to load, first of all, on the CD. And that takes us up to nearly a minute and a half. And if you just happen to be one of those that could afford a floppy disk drive on your C64, and let's face it, they would be dropping in price in 1989 as the 16-bit era was taking hold, you could load these games just as fast in some instances using a floppy drive and a fast load cartridge as you can from the CD. So what we have here is a very interesting bit of microcomputer history in that it's 8-bit games on a CD that you can load for your C64 and it was released before the Codemasters pack. If you know of any other examples of these kind of compilation packs, let me know because I'm a little bit addicted to collecting them now and um, I want to add some more to the collection. But I'm not aware of any others for 8-bit micros that exist, so leave a comment if you know of any. If I had to pick one of these two, I would probably go for the Codemasters pack because you get 30 games, that's 20 more games, and it's £10 cheaper. So that's a bit of a no-brainer for me in terms of value for money. And it makes that whole effort of setting up the CD player a little bit more worthwhile. And I think Rainbow Arts missed a trick by not including more games in their pack. And Rainbow Arts managed to screw up a bit with their pack. On the game Load Runner, there were only 17 levels and not 150 for some unexplained reason. So really, you're only getting nine and a half games and not 10. In conclusion, what I think about these packs is they're a brilliant idea, just flawed in their execution. And if other publishers had followed suit, I think that really would have helped their cause because that would have tempted me to keep my CD player set up permanently. If I had, let's say, 10 CDs with 30 games each, 300 games, at my fingertips across 10 CDs, then yes, of course, I'd keep my CD player out and I'd, I'd go through all of those games without having to go through drawers of tapes um, and discs, expensive discs, because discs were way more expensive than tapes for us here in the UK. So that might have evened the playing field uh, and made it worthwhile, even if it wasn't much quicker to load than a disc. But as it stands, these are the only ones that I know of, and um, they're just an interesting footnote in computing history. Thanks for taking the time to look at this with me today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's tech nibble. And as always, until next time, take care, leave your comments, let me know if any of more of these exist, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.